Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. Um, actually, it's chronologically speaking, uh, it, it's 11 days before Christmas. So merry and happy and healthy and, and all those wonderful holiday greetings. Uh, I'm with Dr. Gloria Bachman, OBGYN, MD, Director of the Women's Health Institute at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. You see how fast I cut that out? You know, I've been saying it for so many years, you know. Um, and I'm also with members of the One Health Club uh, at Rutgers University. And, and that's the purpose of this session is to talk about the One Health Club and, and this uh, amazing journal that they put together and dealing with topics which we're going to talk about. Uh, and uh, so my monologue has come to an end. Uh, and and I think the best thing right now is, is to go around and everybody introduce yourself, uh, who, what, where, when, and then we'll kind of do some more introductions uh, onto One Health. And first and, and foremost, Dr. Gloria Bachman. Thank you, Calvin. And Calvin was one of the first individuals when we thought about really promoting One Health as a way to enhance the planet's health, our wealth, wellness and health, and plants and animals. And we took a trip to Turtleback Zoo together. And we realized that this initiative really has to be moved to the next generation those who are coming uh, into their own, who are going to address the topics of One Health and how do we preserve human wellness? How do we, we preserve animal wellness and plant wellness and the planet? And so the individuals that you're going to be meeting soon are the next generation of One Health advocates. And I'm very, very happy to be their mentor through the Women's Health Institute and the Rutgers One Health Club. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand the microphone over to our next generation of One Health advocates. Nikita. Hi, thank you both for having us here um, and giving us this opportunity to talk about our work. Um, my name is Lakita. I'm a senior at Rutgers. I'm a biochemistry major and a public health and linguistics minor. And I am one of the founding members of our One Health Club and the current vice president. Uh, Amy. Hi, everyone. Thanks again, Calvin and Dr. Bachman, for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Amy. I'm also a senior at Rutgers. I'm majoring in cell biology and neuroscience and minoring in public health and history. Um, and I'm also a founding member of the Rutgers One Health Club, and I'm currently serving as president. Okay. Heather. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you again for inviting um, us onto your platform. Um, I'm Heather. I'm a junior um, here at Rutgers, um, majoring in public health, which is definitely a kind of One Health uh, major. Um, I'm the communications and outreach chair at um, our club, and um, I attended the uh, One Health Consortium in, in August, which was a great experience. Okay. So we have two seniors and one junior. Okay, perfect. So uh, we've got our intros. Um, somebody step up and, and talk about the history uh, of the One Health Club at, at Rutgers. And actually, then I'll come back and ask Dr. Bachman to talk about the history of One Health in general, because it was, well, it was you uh, and Amy uh, in 2016, that spearheaded the movement. But you'll talk about that. First, somebody give me the history of One Health Club at Rutgers. Yes, certainly. So our club, honestly, rocky start because we began the process of establishing our club just as COVID hit. So we did do the process um, almost entirely virtually at first. Um, back then, Amy and I were freshmen, um, but it was spearheaded by... Uh, two seniors, upperclassmen, um, Mugda and Eliana. They're both off at medical school now doing great things, um, but they were great role models for us. They got the club up and running um, with the help of Dr. Bachman, of course. And after that, it took us a couple semesters to you know figure out the virtual Zoom platform and then transitioning to in-person um, and then you know how exactly we would function as an undergraduate club. But so, so in the last three years, couple semesters, um, we've been working on getting our footing now, re expanding our recruitment and outreach um, in the undergraduate population. 
um, at Rutgers. And now we are a pretty <laughs> relatively well-established um, undergraduate academic club now. Um, with We're meeting in person, we meet once a week, um, have some pizza occasionally while we work on our projects, um, present journal clubs to each other, but Amy can go more into detail on what we do. Okay. All right, Amy. Um, you know what? Before Amy, uh, I, I think it's appropriate if, if Dr. Bachman gives a little bit of a history of One Health and defines it so everybody uh, out there kind of understands. Well, let me start with the physician point of view that during my training, humans were looked upon as being isolated from other animals, from plants, from the environment. And so if someone said, I have a cold, they would automatically be given an antibiotic. Then what we realized is that human health is connected to animal health, is connected to plant health, is connected to environmental health, so that we are not isolated from our surroundings, from our communities. Um, we are basically one. That is, we, we hold hands with our forests, we hold hands with our cities, we hold hands with our atmosphere, and that we cannot think of humans as just someone that does not have to worry about anything other than ourselves. So just to fast forward, now when someone has a cold, they're not automatically given an antibiotic because if there's no need for antibiotics, we're wiping out our, quote, good bacteria, that we're made of, of microorganisms that really help us stay healthy. And when we put in artificial types of antibiotics and, and other interventions, we are really destroying our own ecosystem. We're destroying our own health. So that what we're seeing is that our health is dependent on everyone else's health and that we just can't randomly change our own environment by the use of um, all of the, well, and I bring antibiotics up because that really has been one of the major issues, but herbicides, pesticides, eliminating species that really keep the uh, insect population in check, that we just can't do that randomly, that we can't cut down trees to make roads without realizing that we need those trees for adequate oxygenation, for, for air purity, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that there are many implications to what we as humans were doing, and now we're aware that we're doing it and we're stopping it. So the One Health Initiative is that wellness is really dependent on the wellness of our community, of our animals, of our plants, and of our environment. And I do wanna go back to that year because that was the year that we actually started to interface with the species preservation sites in New, Jer in New Jersey, that Calvin and I and a group of individuals actually went to Turtleback Zoo and saw all the species preservation activities that are going on there. So again, this has been really uh, an important aspect for all of us, but in particularly for the healthcare team uh, who are directly trying to keep wellness uh, of humans at the top of the list. And you pioneered the fact that New Jersey became the first state in the country to legislate One Health. You and Amy were among the pioneers to do that. Uh, and, and eventually every state will kind of follow suit. But you would, you, you know, you were a pioneer to, to do that, which was so ad advanced. I mean, absolutely. Really Absolutely, yep. Calvin. We're the first to say that it takes a team, yep. that it just can't be one person, but we all have to sit around the table and come up with what's the best way that we can preserve wellness. Funny, that's one of that's part of the title of this whole series that I do. You know, we the species, we're all one species, you know, on on this little uh, planet. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go off on a soapbox. Uh, Amy, if you can continue what Lakeitha was talking about. Um, with respect to uh, you know your club, the One Health Club, and 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 the origins and some of the things you're doing, 
and then we'll talk a little bit about goals and, and, and the future. So take it away. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Dr. Balkan, for giving that wonderful introduction to One Health as a concept. Um, I think the Rutgers One Health Club came in a very timely manner, you know, during um, the COVID pandemic, just because COVID is a zoonotic illness. And I don't think it could have come at a better time to really raise awareness about how interconnected we all are with our environment and the animals around us. Um, so what we do uh, at Rutgers One Health Club, um, we initially struggled a lot to figure out what kind of format and structure um, we would have our students engage in. But right now we're currently working in um, three different kind of committees. Our first one is the journal club. So we have students preparing presentations regularly about various One Health topics. We've covered um, things like antibiotic resistance with Dr. Bachman covered. Um, zoonotic illness and also even pets, things that we wouldn't, you know, immediately come to mind, but really emphasize that interconnection that we're, um, that we value so much. Um, next, we have the Communications and Outreach Committee, which is, of course, led by Heather. Um, she maintains our social media and also really just tries to get our name out there on our various platforms. Um, and then we have our Programs Committee, which organizes a lot of the different events that um, we create to really get into the New Brunswick community. So we've done things like panel events. Um, we've done fundraising at Rutgers Day. Um, and we're currently working with some local libraries in the area so we can start presenting to um, middle school age kids and really get the concept of One Health um, more deeply entrenched within our community. Okay. Hey, I, uh, when I was investigating uh, the One Health Club and I found the Constitution, which Lakeith laughed at, that I found your constitution. But I, I saw the picture of, of you guys uh, in, in right by a, a greenhouse on, on Rutgers Day. I have that a picture. Uh, you know, I saw the interaction. On, on, uh, and, and, and by the way, afterwards, when we're all done, Heather, we can chat when we go off air for a minute or two, just so, because, you know, you do outreach, I do outreach. Uh, and we can talk about that. But uh, so next up, uh, we've got the history and, and the three, uh, you know, by the way, I'm taking notes on you guys, you know, I'm, as we go along, I'm taking notes um, uh, on on the three things that you've been concentrating on. Uh, are there goals? Are there uh, existing goals that you've set for One Health? Anybody? Yeah, so I would say primarily one of the things we're really trying to um, work on expanding, I would say, is networking and finding new advocacy opportunities for our members to take part in um and I, it's it's been going really well we've met so many different professionals um recently and it's thanks to great networking opportunities like like this one um and all these uh connections dr bachman's helping us um and relationships we're working on developing with so many um very prevalent one health figures um and for example one uh in back in august we at Rutgers we held the one health consortium led by dr bachman and um heather was actually able to attend so that was just one great opportunity for us to really get you know start to build connections and and meet um you know these professional figures not just other uh, because you know as Dr. Brockman was saying we're the next generation so we we're really trying to look up to and learn from the professional the doctors the veterinarians um the the doctorates you know all these leaders and who are enacting so much great change such as you know the task force uh, we really want to learn a lot from them so Heather do you just want to say a few words about the the consortium yeah, definitely. Um, I was really glad that we were given the opportunity to attend um, because I think we're like the youngest ones in the room and they're all these like all experts and they're also um, med students, all these people we could learn from. Um, the person next to us was a veterinarian. The other person was a person who works in like agricultural things. So definitely a lot of um, collaboration between different, um, uh, you know, sex of the um, One Health um, concept. Um, one thing that I mentioned in the um, journal actually, actually um, was how important it was to stress how everything in this world is connected and interconnected. 
and um, we have to communicate in order to um, really address a lot of these uh, issues in health um, to get the full picture. Um, so yeah, it was definitely a really good uh, experience. I was actually at that consortium too, um, which was which was fabulous. It was one of my few ventures out um, of my little uh, little cubicle here, uh, and it was it was fabulous. And look forward to more of those. And, and um, actually, I'm, there's a picture. I, I have that group picture, but I'm always stuck in the back uh, because of I'm I'm tall. But the, it was a great consortium. And, and and the students really were there in, in, in really pretty good numbers too. Um, any uh, kind of future think with uh, One Health and and you know you two seniors are going to be um, moving on and and you know Heather's generation is going to take that over. Is there a future thing to some of the things you'd like to do and you'd like to see uh, One Health Club go in different directions? I think something we definitely want to establish is a more regular presence in some um, aspect of our community. Um, so what we're trying to dive into this year, like I was talking a little about earlier, is um, having some regular programming at like local libraries or local schools, just so we can start introducing the One Health concept early, um, just because, you know, the importance of animal and environmental health is typically overlooked um, in relation to human health. and you know, in schools and in libraries, those are centers of learning. And it's really important that we raise the next generation to be, um, you know, like holistically thinking about these kinds of things. Brilliant that you do that. Cause you know, younger kids look up to you guys uh, and identify with you guys. And, and if impact is gonna be made, it's gonna be made more from you to kids coming up than it is for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the prune juice guy, you know, uh, uh, but uh, that's a that's a wonderful direction to go is to reach out to schools and to kind of, uh, you know, light their fire, so to speak. Um, so next on the agenda uh, is to talk about the journal, of which I'm going to be sharing and showing the world uh, um, and some of the abstracts and things you've done, some of the research. Anybody want to? Take that on. That's the 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 essence of this this session is really talking about the journal, which is coming out. Yeah, so we're really really excited about the journal and that it's finally complete. This was our little project, our passion project that we worked on uh, for the last year or so. Um, and just want to say thank you to Dr. Bachman for for providing us with the opportunity and the idea. So our journal is based off of the. Um, already pre-existing journal called Writing Heals and Inspires based out of the Women's Health Institute. Um, and there was a first edition and a second edition. Um, each one had its own theme. Um, so the previous one was about maternal health. Um, it's a great journal. It's on the Women's Health Institute website. Everyone should, everyone should definitely take a look at that as well. Um, but so we had the idea of the third edition being about One Health and being completely led by our undergraduate student organization. So we took on the project and we had uh, a lot of our students write for the journal. We had a lot, um, a few med students, we had some professors, we had some invited um, essays and remarks from, from One Health leaders and figures um, around the state. So it compiled beautifully. We have so many different um, One Health topics that are that are discussed and I can, actually start sharing my screen and show um that's great and show our draft of it that's so great this is what it looks like it looks amazing super <laughs> super clean i love it um and then you know we start off with the preface um we just talk about one health again introduce the concept um and why it's important and where this journal the idea for this journal came about there's a little foreword from me and Amy as leaders of our organization and um, basically the intro we gave today, how we came about, what we do. Um, then we have some amazing opening remarks from some really inspiring One Health role models. We have Dr. Struve from the One Health Commission, uh, Dr. Khan 
um, from the One Health Initiative, Dr. Kaplan from the One Health Initiative, um, Amy Poppy, as we all know, from the One Health Steering Committee, Dr. Zwick from Rutgers Research. Um, he helped uh, host the consortium in August. Um, we have we even have um, Chancellor Provost Conway um, from Rutgers, New Brunswick. So it's really great to see exactly how far our reach has um, is going. Um, and then we have our very own Dr. Bachman to wrap up our opening remarks, also representing the steering committee. Um, and then just a quick look at our table of contents where you can see um, exactly the different topics we hit. There's so many important topics, um, malaria and maternal health, plant-based diets, uh, let's see, lead poisoning, air pollution, water pollution, soil health, even how it ties into how, how One Health can affect health disparities. And then at the very end, we just have some ambassador essays from uh, students that were at the One Health Consortium. So just some perspectives there. Um, yeah, so I think this is a good sneak peek at the journal. So if any of this sounds interesting to our, our listeners here, they should definitely take a look. Um, Calvin, I'm sure we'll be sharing the link attached to this recording and it'll be available on the Women's Health Institute website. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for that opportunity just to give a yeah. quick look at that. Uh, you know, some of those, the, the green plant the diet, uh, uh, I, I, I like to think of myself, uh, I build myself as a poster boy for some of the, for some of the abstracts that you, you did because in 1975 and in, in the commitment to the environment, you know, I'll just share it with you guys. Uh, I, I knew enough back in 75 that that uh, the beef industry uh, spends a ton of money and uses a ton of water to water the grass so that the cows can eat the grass and so they can make a Big Mac. Uh, and, and, and I knew that. And I also knew that that whole process, there's a ton of methane going up in, in, into the atmosphere. That's when I was kind of like your age a little bit. Uh, and, and, uh, so I said to myself, I, I, I gotta, I gotta make a, a personal commitment. And, and I stopped, uh, e eating everything with four legs. I'm not perfect. Uh, I had to deal with my mother and, and, and a wife who insisted on cooking, but point being, uh, I stopped eating everything with four legs in 1975. And I've been that way uh, ever since, but there's a, a side effect to that uh, uh i had a calcium c2 scan of my coronary arteries to see how i'm doing as a septuagenarian to see if i need a rotor rooter procedure at rwj hospital uh, and it, as it turns out my lifestyle and the diet and and, and this stuff uh, i have zero coronary artery plaque so that allows me uh, at my advanced age to function 100 percent because all the the vessels up here are getting full blood supply. There's no, there's no atherosclerotic plaques up there. The point being, for your generation and and uh, thinking about what you wrote in that abstract, uh, uh, it works. You know the system works, and if you start thinking about this stuff at your age and you live a life accordingly, uh, it affords you going into different generations uh, full throttle. I mean, that's my comment when I saw that you did that. I think it's great. Yeah, that's amazing, Calvin. Yeah, actually, you know what? Uh, it is amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, it's a great example of just how how applicable these things are and how how crucial they are. And, you know, in daily life, there these conversations aren't happening. Right. And you know what? Uh, and, and every all of us have gone through your generation. And, you know, when we were that age, Dr. Bachman, uh, well, I'm older, but we don't think about these things because, you know, we think we're immortal kind of thing. But I did think about it, but for different reasons. Uh, you know, I thought about the environment and, and actually you guys, and I really cared and I had to make a commitment and it was a tough commitment. But looking back, I mean, it was the right thing to do because it, it's afforded me a really productive lifestyle. You know, I, I, I began my teaching career short-lived, but uh, three years ago, Rutgers asked me to teach career explorations, networking. I'm a very good networker. So at 74, I became uh, a lecturer 
well, you, the kids had to call me professor, which I loved. Um, but I became a lecturer at 74 at Rutgers University. Why? Because my lifestyle and the paying attention to diet and nutrition works. So uh, Yeah, that's really great. We actually talk about a lot of the health benefits of plant-based diets in um, our journal. So it's really great to like, you know, see um, a successful story of that and see that you've been able to do so many great things with yeah. the great lifestyle that you lead. Um, you know, plant-based diets are associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, as you said, type two diabetes, cancer, so many different chronic illnesses. And it's able to afford still so many health benefits in terms of proteins, vitamins, nutrients. Um, and as you were saying earlier, um, it's not only the cruelty-free aspect, but the environmental aspect in terms of, you know, how much water it takes to raise these animals um, and the effect of raising animals on like such large swaths of land. Correct. Correct. And that was my motivation back then. So, you know, again, it works, but uh, it, it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime of thinking. It, it's a commitment. But more people need to know and see and, and examples and, and the fact that you did the journal to begin to. I mean, I think it's great that that was one of the topics because it, it, it's so important. Uh, uh, and especially to to innovate, to uh, uh, pass that message along to your generation. And, you know, of course. You know, we're going to take this and throw it out there and, and hopefully tons of tons of students and young people will see that and maybe you know, press the right button. You know, funny, there's an old saying, uh, he or she who saves a life saves the world. So if we can get the one person, hey, that's great. Um, so um, uh, anybody have uh, any other comments, questions? Um yeah, I'd like to add on um, to say that I think for our generation, there's like a growing popularity of vegetarian and like vegan diets. So I feel like there is a greater push to um, decrease our meat consumption. Um, you know, I've seen like restaurants or in the grocery store, they have more vegan options. Um, and I think that's really important since um, I did do my journal um, entry on um, deforestation and uh, I did state how. Um, large chunks of the Amazon rainforest, um, uh, which are like the lungs of our earth, um, are being cut down for um, uh, for, for cattle and, and other animals. And that's harming not only the indigenous people, but also the animals that live there and ultimately everyone else on the planet. So um, I think it is important how uh, our generation, I feel like um, is, is reducing our, our meat consumption. It's interesting you mentioned the Amazon. Uh, um, part of my part of my interviews uh, is with uh, uh, his name is Alan Hesse. He lives at the border uh, of the Amazon, and he does all kinds of sustainability and 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 uh, he his project is to educate young children about deforestation, as you mentioned, Heather, uh, and sustainability. Uh, and and he's constantly writing articles about the, those issues uh, of the Amazon uh, and, and how many species we're losing because of the deforestation, uh, et cetera. Um, and cutting trees down takes away oxygen from the Amazon. The whole, but that's great that you did that. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so with you on that. We're well, all with I, you. Well, I'd like to know, I'd like to ask each one of our One Health members What's the one thing that you've done in your life that contributes to the wellness of our environment, people, animals, just as Calvin did with uh, no longer eating beef or meat? Does anybody want to say one of the things that they do? Um, unfortunately, I still eat beef. I'm trying to reduce my red my meat consumption, but... For me, um, I do have a little vegetable garden in my backyard and also a compost. Um, obviously that's pretty small scale, but um, 
still um, I'm getting foods that are right in my backyard and um, don't have to use pesticides or anything else that other large scale farms have to use. And it's a lot cheaper than um, buying at the grocery store. Right, so that, that you're producing some of the produce that uh, you consume. Anybody else? Yeah, I actually, um, similar to Calvin, I've actually have not eaten red meat for most of my life. I think when I was around like eight or nine, I accidentally watched some sort of vegan or vegetarian documentary that traumatized me enough not to eat any meat. Um, until my parents were finally able to force me to, you know, start eating a bit of poultry, a bit of fish to get those essential fats and nutrients. Um, but I just stayed away from red meat. I know um, there are a lot of health benefits to it, as we were talking about before. So I've been like that since I was very young. Um, also, when I was in high school, I was involved in a youth group for volunteering. And of course, this is very small scale, but we would always organize things like cleanups around our local communities and along the shores. Um, and just, I think, each individual person making their own little dent into, you know, preserving the environment, hopefully has, makes a difference in the future. I think one thing that my family really does that I have religiously picked up from, especially my mom, is reusing almost everything we can possibly reuse especially um i'd say like plastic bags from the store before the plastic ban bag ban went into effect uh we would have a huge collection of those and we would reuse them again and again and again until the bag literally wasn't usable anymore um and also like plastic food containers or jars or things like that after we finished the food that we actually bought in it oh it's always a surprise in my kitchen you open something and it's definitely not what the label says it is <laughs> inside because we yeah, things like that we we've always reused. So reusing, repurposing things just to, you know, just not one use and done to fill up our landfills, I think is an important principle that could make a lot of difference if a lot of families um Correct. did. Correct. It's great stuff. Mm -hmm. you you're all so in tuned. Um we just have to take your energy and we gotta spread it around and, and pass it along. You know, we've gotta light those fires. Um so I actually have sorry sorry yes no go go oh, I just have one last question for Dr. Bachman actually um so you you and Amy Poppy started this whole process with the One Health um, steering committee in 2016 right so as like local leaders of of this initiative um I just wanted to ask you you know as we're growing into your footsteps as well what are some challenges you have faced in the process of trying to you know, raise awareness about the importance of One Health, something we should look out for? I think basically it was the question that I just asked, that we all have to contribute, that it's not just the education, because we all can be, you know, knowledgeable about what we have to do, but then we have to also follow through. And you brought it up very nicely. And I do the same thing as your mom. Everything in my house is recycled. <laughs> so when people come in, and they know me and they know that I don't produce too much garbage, um, that uh, they're very careful about uh, making sure that they don't bring a lot of disposable things to my home uh, so that we don't have garbage. But I think it really is um, doing our part, not only being educated and actually seeing what happens when we don't. And I think many of you brought up the COVID and how that overtook um, all of our scientific ability until we finally got it under control. But so many lives were lost. And when we look at pollution and what it's doing to pulmonary function for so many individuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's, you know, what can we do? So one of the things that I do is if I don't have to drive, I live fairly close to work, I don't drive, I, I, I walk. So that my not taking the car is decreasing emissions that day. And, and you say, well, it's just one person. So it's not gonna make that much of a difference. But I think by Calvin having us and by Calvin being an advocate, a One Health advocate as well, it's we are one person in a team. 
And so when we get teams together, then it's more than just Gloria Bachman walking to work, but it's many individuals working, walking to work, many individuals not using their car, or even the issue of carpooling, that if we can, you know, actually utilize public transportation as well, or, or utilize, you know, many people going to one particular area in the same car, um, that makes sense. And I know that uh, I'm one of the persons that if I go into New York City, I will never take a car. I'm, I'm always a train person or a subway person, but never a car person. So it's the collective that we really have to start with ourselves, be an, an example like, like your parents were, be an example, and each one of us play a role in changing what we do when we know it's not beneficial to the One Health cause. And each one of you had your own way of doing it, but again, we can embrace more ways as well. But I'd like to also, I'd like to each hear each of your vision. Of what do you see dramatically changing in 10 years? And I'll tell you what I'd like to see, and, I, and Calvin can too. What I see, and we talked about this with your parents and me, is in my community, I am really shocked at the amount of garbage we produce. That we produce a lot of recyclables, but we also produce a lot of garbage. And many of the individuals that I know have small families, there, there may be two huge um, containers of garbage. And what I'd like to see is, is less throwaways, that even though we're now not using plastic bags, but a lot less throwaways and using the same uh, container for our coffee over and over again, rather than every time we buy a cup of coffee, we get a new container that each one of us carry around our own container and, and not utilize it. So my vision would be that we would only have to have a, a, a garbage collection once a month rather than once or twice a week. But I'd like to hear everyone else's vision for 10 years. So mine is let's stop the garbage. <laughs> no, I can I can definitely get behind that. I agree with that 100%. Something that I actually think about a lot is it's really strange, but like the idea of the milkman um just a couple of decades ago and the fact that people would save like these glass jars and there would be one man that would come around to neighborhoods and deliver that milk and you know, we didn't have these plastic cartons that you get in grocery stores anymore. Um, and then suddenly the culture shifted and I guess corporation, the plastic corporation got so big on uh, disposables and one-time use that that became the status quo and the norm. But I think especially now as our generation realizes the urgency of climate change and how our environment is deteriorating, I'm really hoping that because obviously it's, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. It's a societal thing. We really need to shift our mindset to seeing um, like objects that we have laying around as things that are, if not permanent, long-term things to be reused, things to, um, you know, that have value. Um, maybe not going back to a milkman system, but, you know, like redefining our relationship with plastics and glass and what we use around the house. Well, maybe you can initiate that at Rutgers, that all we have are glass bottles of, uh, of the, of, in the dining halls of just milk and things like that, or, you know, something that's not throwaway. That's a, that's a good point. It's a great point. By the way, I, I, I remember we had a milkman and, and, and we also had a coal bin where they would come, a truck would come and deliver coal and we would use the coal to heat the house. That's, and, you know, I wrote about that in, in my second novel, uh, how much I remember. But, Amy, we had, we had Milkman, and I still remember his name. You know, his name was Joe, and, and they had a big block of ice in the truck. There was no refrigeration. I mean, that's how old I am. So there was no refrigeration. They delivered milk, but it was kept uh, in the truck on a big block of ice. And they left it outside uh, two bottles, and then you've drank the milk, and you put the two bottles back out there. Of course, I pose a question to you all, um, uh, and the question is: uh, if everybody has their own glass, 
uh, for milk or coffee or whatever, um, you're going to use a lot of water to to wash that. So it, it's um, it's a bit of a conundrum. Uh, uh, I mean, how do we how do we circumvent that? You know, we eliminate plastic and and throw away, and and then we have reusable, but the reusable has got to be washed. It's going to use a lot of water. I, I don't know the answer. Yes, Calvin, you bring up a good point, but it's 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 always the, the the degree. So the degree of the plastic, I think, is worse than the degree of putting a, a basin of of water in your you know sink and rinsing off and then have throwing that out and putting clear water and rinsing it rather than having constant water flow because you could say the same thing with a daily shower how much do we use with a daily shower versus a sponge bath where we would just take a basin of water as individuals did in the past and you you know you wash yourself with that basin of water versus turning on a shower and you you know one goes through a lot more water but i'd like to hear the two others with their vision for 10 years so amy's was bringing back a, a you know milk persons <laughs> um i something i'm excited excited to see is the i guess the rise in electric vehicles recently it you a few years ago like say like just like eight or nine years ago that would that seem like like a fantasy type of the type of thing like something that only like really rich people would have or it's like the technology is like way off in the future but just in the last like maybe five years it's like exponentially increased and now so many of my own like extended family members everyone's um getting electric cars and now my family's getting our first electric car um and I just think it's really exciting to see um, because I, because I know some people now who have it, they tell me about all, um, like benefits of it. Like they can see exactly how much they're like saving in emissions and gas and things like that. And I'm just excited about how the, like Dr. Bachman said, it, it takes everyone to do it, but now we're getting there more and more and more people are getting electric vehicles. So I'm excited to see how much of an impact that'll have on like air pollution and emissions and greenhouse gases. Heather? Yeah, for me, um, this isn't a specific thing, um, like what Keitha said and Amy said, but I definitely see more climate change awareness, um, especially like in politics and policy, um, because, you know, the science is undeniable at this point. And I think that, you know, oil companies and all these other people who are trying to swat down the scientific evidence, um, you can't really do anymore. And, um, but one thing I see, uh, one challenge I see is greenwashing. Um, I think a lot of companies might try to get on the train, uh, the, the bandwagon of um, being eco-friendly and environmentally friendly, but in reality not have a substantial um, uh, contribution to lowering um, carbon emissions or reducing waste. So um, although there might be a bigger push for climate change and other environmental issues, um, I do see um, pro problems with, um, you know, a facade of, of, of being actually um, uh, in reality, uh, eco-friendly and um, pushing for uh, climate change, uh, um, uh, you know, um, solutions. Great answers. Great answers. Um, my, uh, my my thing is, as I would, there's a slight subtle trend today uh, uh, of people throwing up their hands and saying we're not going to be able to slow global warming. Uh, you know, the, there was a goal, I think, 10 years down the road to have uh, keep it at 1.5 percent degree. Uh, increase and, and and you know cop 26 crop 27 you know they all talked about that but there's a subtle thing going on now and, and it, it kind of bothers me and, and what i love to see the subtle change that i'm seeing is uh people are throwing up their hands that we can't do it we won't be able to do uh 
we can't control it. So let's go to sustainability. Let's live and find ways to live with a hotter planet. And that kind of scares me. So I'd like to see us go back, uh, 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 go back. In other words, we're saying we, we can't stop driving. We can't stop the fossil fuel stuff. Uh, and what annoys me is, is fossil fuel companies, they sponsor all these environmental, you know, they, they do the lunches. And, and um, a lot of people don't know that, you know, COP27, which was in Egypt, uh, you know, these fossil fuel companies are sponsoring lunches and, and dinners. And uh, so I'd like to see more get away from sustainability and go back to really slowing it down. And the other thing I'd love to see in 10 years, which is semi-realistic, is is nuclear fusion taking over supplying all of New York City and all of New Jersey with energy. It won't work for cars, but it'll work dramatically. Uh, and that's unlimited energy. So I'd like to see that come into being in my whole house here and everything powered by nuclear fusion. It's almost like Back to the Future. That car that he drove around in was nuclear fusion. They threw in garbage and beer and all kinds of stuff, and 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 he burned that. I watch that movie all the time. I want to go back to the future. That's it. Uh, this is this has been great. Anybody have any wrap up comments? Um, um, uh, this has kinda, been. I'm so sorry. Um, but kind of going off what you said. Um, one of the things I'm most excited for is, you know, more clean sources of energy, especially solar energy. I've read so many articles about how, you know, on Earth we get so much, we we get so much UV light, and it has enough power to, you know, um, be responsible for the electricity of all of our cities, all of our towns, our civilization, and we just need to build that infrastructure. Um, obviously it's a very, very big investment, but I think if we start turning more to these renewable sources of energy, then we don't have to rely so much on fossil fuels. And that'll be a great way to slow down climate change, um, and not have to tolerate those higher temperatures. Anybody else? However, um, one problem actually with, um, solar panels is there is like um this issue with indigenous people because indigenous and people who are in the um global south because the solar panels they have you know they have copper and other um elements that you, you know you have to mine for and people in these mines are you know people of color people in the global south and so definitely we could we could we should increase um our use of solar panels but there's you know um there's problems with, um, you know, the labor that's going into these solar panels. So we have to just make sure if it's ethical and um, who are we actually benefiting uh, in the end. Wow, great point. Really great point. Uh, it's like almost, uh, it's almost like never ending the things that you have to consider. You know, just say an abstract thing like you know, solar panels, but there's so much more that goes into it. When they, I mean, all of it. Uh, great point, Heather. Um, so uh, I'm going to do a wrap uh, and thank you all. And, and by the way, uh, I sit here 12 hours a day. I'm always around. We can do this again and again. And, and it's, it's endless on the things that we can talk about. Uh, um, and, and I can't thank, I know you're in the middle of the finals, aren't you guys? Yeah. And, and the fact that you're here and, and during the middle of that, that's testament to your commitment Dr. Bachman, you've got more stuff on your plate than I can ever imagine. And thank you for being here. Um, uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, and again, happy, healthy, merry, all good things. Um, uh, I'm going to close the recording now. Don't leave because we're going to do a wrap. So I'm, I'm again, I'm thanking, really thanking you all for the time, and your precious time for being here because we have a precious planet. And it makes sense. You too, Kevin. Thank you. thank you for being a wonderful host for us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Stay. I'm stopping the recording.